Perfect. All right. Um, thank you very much uh, for having me and uh, for bearing with me for the next uh, 15 minutes. Um, I'm really looking forward to talking to you a little bit about machine learning, but more importantly about the business impact on the metrics you guys are using on uh, your business models, or specifically taking my company and walk you through a little bit how we work with machine learning and how we use it. And before digging right into it, I'd of course quickly like to introduce myself. Um, I'm Chris, I'm one of the co-founders and the CEO of a startup called Lengu. Um, we are we claim to be um, one of the world's most advanced technology platforms for professional uh, business and technical translations. Um, we're not a traditional translation agency and we're a technology company focusing on languages. Um, we're a team of 28 um, currently based in Berlin. We also have an office in Karlsruhe. Um, and half of our team is um, engineers or machine learning engineers. Um, before starting Lingu, I worked as a localization manager for one of the big IT consultancies, um, which is how I got into the translation space in the first place. And then uh, during my studies in data science at Columbia University, I learned what tremendous business impact machine learning can have and how you can apply it in a business context. Um, at Lingu, that's exactly uh, what we're doing every day, what we're striving to do every day. So I'd like to end this first quick introduction of myself with our mission statement, so that you understand how deep machine learning is in our DNA. So what we're doing is we're, we're rethinking the concept of how machine translation, or how translations in general work by combining the human creativity, which you still need from translations, I can already say that, with the precision of artificial intelligence. And the motivation why we're doing this um, is pretty easy. We want to drastically reduce turnaround times of professional translations and, of course, um, also reduce costs in doing that, but very importantly, also increase the quality through consistency in translations. Um, but enough about me and my company for now. Um, what I would like you guys to take from my brief talk today are two things. First thing is, what is machine learning and how does it work? Um, I'm going to try to be very high level, um, but I think it's very important as we have some business people um, in, the, in the audience as well, um, that we get at least some of the facts and some of the terms we use and hear flying around all day uh, correct. And later on, getting into how you can use machine learning or what potential impact this can, can have by walking you through how we did it at my company. So, Let's start right with um, a little crash course on machine learning. Um, I call it Machine Learning 101. And before we do that, I think there's one thing we have to get straight from the very beginning. Because unfortunately, these days in the media, the terms artificial intelligence and machine learning are used quite interchangeably, although they refer to a little bit of different things. And the easiest way to explain that is when you think about how you would define intelligence in general, whether it's a computer system or an organism. Um, we define it as the ability to observe the environment, learn from its environment, and then autonomously act on certain tasks. So by this sheer, very broad definition, you can already see that the machine learning part is actually one, only one component of an artificial intelligence system. Um, which, for example, includes sensors and all these other kind of things. Uh, the second uh, terminology we have to get straight is between weak AI and strong AI, the difference. And when we talk about weak AI, that's what we already use every day. It's self-driving cars, it's a uh, movie or song um, recommendations, um, chess computers, all this stuff. It basically deals with solving one specific task, whereas when we talk about strong AI, and we talk about a computer system that can automate all tasks a human can do, at least as good as a human can do it, um, which obviously we're still very far away from, um, but which most of the science, science fiction movies refer to, and also unfortunately um, the media quite a lot recently. Now, the example I would like to use today to explain machine learning, um, maybe some of you have already seen it, but I really love it, is image recognition. So the automatic recognition in head of patterns and pictures to find out what is depicted on a picture. And as you can see from this little example already, sorry, <laughs> um, is that even for a human eye, it's not that easy to actually figure out whether there is a muffin or a dog displayed. And now think about how difficult it is to write an algorithm that determines that automatically. And the entire 
motivation of machine learning is that you do not have to write this algorithm. And in classical programming, what we would do, we would start writing hundreds of lines of codes, getting all the different exceptions, and now moving from the example from dogs and muffins to fruits, because it's a little bit easier to depict and uh, explain to you. And we would write, we had to catch all the different exceptions in order to get a robust algorithm. And what we try to do with machine learning is, we do not have to write that, we just give the algorithm a lot of training data, a lot of examples of fruits where we already know what type of fruit it is, and it learns these patterns itself. Now, um, getting a little bit broader again, um, when we talk about machine learning, we usually have to differentiate between three different categories, um, supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and reinforcement learning. The example I just gave with um, classifying, it's called classification, like finding how the type of food is depicted, is a typical supervised learning example together with any regressions you might have heard about before. What we do there is we simply give an algorithm some input data and some output data, in this case pictures of fruits and what type of food they are, which is the output. And the goal is that the algorithm learns a rule, a pattern, how it can map these inputs to outputs so that it can predict a new picture where we don't know yet what it is, what type of food is depicted. And we talk about unsupervised learning, we only have input data. And our motivation here is not classification, but it is to find hidden structures in data that group together similar um, objects into one bucket, into one class. And a typical example would be a customer segmentation. And the application is usually always things where we humans are not capable or not so good at doing, but, but every time when it gets to multidimensional um, problems such as customer segmentation, there's hundreds of factors going into, we as humans are simply not good at looking at an Excel sheet and finding out which groups are there, and which we could, for example, with different marketing measurements address differently. And lastly, there's reinforcement learning. It's a completely different idea of machine learning. Here we don't have any input or output data. But what we do is we reward the algorithm or punish it depending on what action it takes. And the motivation is then that the algorithm learns the optimal strategy to solve a certain problem. And a typical example is that how you teach a chess computer how to actually play chess. Now, all of this theory is nice, but let's talk a little bit more detail how does it actually work. Going back to the image recognition example, in every um, from these supervised learning examples, you basically always have a training um, phase and a prediction phase. The first problem we have to overcome is how can a computer understand when we look at a picture? So we have to make a picture readable for a computer. And readable means usually numbers, so what we do with pictures, um, we usually reduce the um, quality of a picture tremendously so that we only have 4x4 four four pixels anymore. We then take out the color and everything else, and basically what we do is we check whether is there some content in the picture or not. If it is, we put a 1, if it's not, we put a 0. Then we very simplify what we're doing is for 100,000 pictures of apples and bananas in this case, we take an average of all these um, numerical representations or vectors. And then in the prediction phase, we pre-process it in the same way, and we compare these vectors with the vectors in the training phase. So comparing, we, sub we subtract them. And then we see, um, when we compare this picture to a banana, we see that only 6 out of the 16 pixels have the same, um, in, this, in the same space, the same number, whereas in the case of uh, an apple, we have 12 out of 6 correct, out of 16. So we would obviously predict that in this case, this picture is an apple, much rather than a banana. Now, now is a good time to introduce another buzzword, which I think um, everyone should have heard about um, already, which are neural networks. And you come back to the example I gave um, with um, the image recognition of uh, fruits. What you're essentially doing is, you're saying that if in pixel 1, in out of 3 out of 4 times in the training data set, this pixel is 1, then it's more likely to be an apple than a banana. So you have direct independent connections between the input um, factors and the output factors. And the entire motivation of neural networks is, is that you're connecting these different inputs through these so-called hidden layers. So what happens then is, is you can give the problem much more context. To put this a little bit in a more business um, idea, how it's easier to understand, you can not only say anymore if pixel 1 is a 1 and it's probably a banana pixel 2 and so on, you can say the upper part of the picture 
is um, empty, then it's more likely to be a bad memory. So you're combining the different um, input factors into one information piece. Now, um, now that we have verified some machine learning and that we are all experts now, or at least all on the same level, and um, we have to talk a little bit about where all this hype is currently coming from. And because everything I told you now is not new, it's like all based 1950s, even earlier. So the only thing that is different these days is, is two trends colliding. The first thing is that we have a lot more data, which we need for the tracking data sets, as storing data is becoming cheaper and cheaper every day, while at the same time computing power is getting cheaper and cheaper as well. So we're now in a, in a phase where it actually becomes economically feasible to use machine learning in a business context, whereas previously it was more interesting for research because it was simply too expensive to use it. In order to end this first part about machine learning, um, I would like to pick up a question I get asked a lot when giving these talks is whether we have to be worried um, about machine learning, that they're gonna take over, that it's gonna take over the world. And um, I personally very strongly think that we don't have to, that's always my answer. Because machine learning as of today is very good at automating these very specific tasks. But even with these tasks, when you look at the media, nearly every day you see that some things go terribly wrong. Like I said, driving across caching, some um, hate speech classification is going terribly wrong, causing huge PR disasters, so to say. And even going back to the, um, to the initial example I had, just pointing out again how difficult a very easy task such as image recognition, image recognition is, you can see from this again that it's not so easy to find where it's working only a this. So again, think about the of this one algorithm. <coughs> now, instead of being worried about uh, machine learning, I am a strong advocate of um, embracing actually the freedom we get from machine learning as it can automate a lot of these annoying iterated tasks you currently have to do and focus on the business opportunities it can actually create. So when you summarize that, um, there's a strong movement that many people talk about it, that we should AI actually not define as artificial intelligence, but as augmented intelligence, augmenting people and doing their work more efficiently better than before. With that being said, um, I would like to uh, jump into an application of machine learning by taking uh, Lingu, my company, as an example, and um, how we used it. Now, um, there are hundreds of applications for machine learning. There are hundreds of um, already um, pre-built services you can use in your organizations to automate or optimize certain processes. However, the most, the one that bears the most um, pain for any organization is always approaching um, a custom solution. Custom solution meaning that it automates your core processes in your organization that are very specific for you using your own data you are generating every day. The motivation of any custom solution or a general machine learning is of course to automate business processes and to reduce costs tremendously, but very importantly, increasing the decision or uh, the quality of decision making processes. So when we take the example at my company, Lingo, we offer two relations. So the first thing when you start thinking about you want to use machine learning, should always be that you point out your entire core process of what you're doing. So that's exactly what I did here. And um, a translation project is usually very simple. You get a document to be translated, you need to make a call to the customer, then hopefully accepts it, then it does so, you have to find the best qualified translator to do the translation. Then there is usually a proofreading step afterwards and a QA step. So there's three different humans involved. There's a lot of communication happening in between, between all these parties, and then you send out the finished translation with the invoice. So there's a lot of process already in a very simple service you're offering, and there's a lot of potential for automation. But now when you think about machine learning, and you have to think twice whether you actually need machine learning, because most of the processes, which I also get recommended in giving these talks, do not need machine learning at all to automate them. They're very simple computer programs like we know them, and so it was also, it was also in our case. In order to create a code, there is no machine learning required. In order to enable communication between parties, while well, to use machine learning there, you can just build a simple chat and they can exchange, same with the voices. However, there are a couple of processes, also in our and fairly simple product, where machine learning makes absolute sense. And the first two we focus on is the allocation of the right translator, as well as automating the translation itself. 
with machine with machine translation. So let's talk about the first process. And in order to understand why we're doing this, you have to understand that in order to provide a really good translation, you do not only need a native speaker of the target language, but you need someone who's very experienced in the field, who's a subject matter expert, so that he knows which wordings, which terminologies to use for a certain translation. Think about a very technical manual about some machine. You need someone who's an expert in this field that he can do a good translation. So, how it usually works in a traditional agency is that's usually in the head of people. Like they know this translator has a lot of experience in this field, so he's going to do a good job because he has done something similar a lot of times before. That's exactly what we automate using machine learning. The first thing when you upload a document to our platform to be translated, it's being categorized with the same way I recently introduced with image recognition. So we then know it's a contract, legal contract in the financial area, let's say. What we then do is a little bit more advanced. We look at all the translators that are qualified for this specific vertical and then compare it to all the previous translations they have done before with the intention of finding people who have done the most similar, who have translated the most similar documents as many times as possible before because it gives us a very high probability that they will do a good job again on this translation as well. And with that being said, we get the ranking of translators who are most experienced to do these jobs. There are hundreds of other factors flying in, which is not so important. And all of this happens in a couple of seconds. So you can imagine usually this process will take at an agency a couple of, like half an hour to one hour. It's only, um, it's only one second, you're connected to the best translator, and you actually start translating our platform. Now all this stuff, including all the classical programming stuff, the code, invoice automation, etc., and was under the umbrella of process automation. Of course, the more interesting thing we learned pretty fast this is that you can use a customer's past translation data for its matching technology, but it's much more interesting to use it for actually automating the translation itself, because when you remember the process graph before, it takes the longest time, this initial translation. So what we do since the beginning of the last year is, um, we build so-called customer-specific translation networks, which are essentially machine translation engines customized towards one company. And how you can imagine it is, it's a large database of all previous translations a customer has done, as well as its ongoing demand on our platform, and including any supporting materials you might have to do a translation, communication guidelines, style guides, glossaries, anything you name. So by throwing all of this into a machine, what the machine actually does, it learns the lingo of a specific company. Which words does it use in which context? Which um, sentence structures does it use? Which type of, um, um, how, how they talk to people in different use cases? Like all these specifics that make language really important and how make, makes it really valuable, especially when you think about marketing. The, the, the idea of this is that by doing that, we get a um, much pre translation quality from the machine that is three times compared to Google, DeepL, and all the ones you usually use better, which of course reduces the time our translators have to spend to proofread it and reduces the entire um, time of the translation project tremendously and also makes it a little bit cheaper. Now, the beauty of this is that it's again a dynamic, dynamic continuously improving system. Like with the matching before, the more translations we have done, the better we understand what our translators are good at translating, the better we can do the matching. Now the more translations we have done for our customers, the better the machine translation gets. It learns another exception with every document that's being translated and can provide a better pre-translation every time. And the translator orders something, meaning the pre-translation quality is going up over time. The um, time it takes a proofreader to do the work goes down, and hence for also the cost stuff. Now, um, the interesting part now is what is the, the business impact of doing all of this. So why we were focusing on process automation. Uh, we were already able to establish quite a good um, advance towards our competition in terms of time and, uh, time and money or costs, how, um, how expensive translations are, which were around 30% compared to the market average. But now by introducing machine translations, we get you can deliver translation 65% faster at half of the usual price point. And that, of course, becomes a game changer now, especially because of the learning component, meaning that we have such a 
strong advantage, competitive advantage to our competitors because we started in the very beginning to do this, that even if our competitors would get hold of this technology and they couldn't catch up because the systems are already continuously training on that, and we of course own the data. And the most interesting um, part of this, uh, of this slide though is this high quality of translations. We have a very, very low um, complaint rate, so to say, and much lower than on average in the industry. Because what you can do with machine translations, or what is something people do not intuitively think about this, is that you can increase consistency in translations dramatically. Think about a very large translation project where a contract has to be translated overnight over 100 pages. You have to have 10 people work on that. Now, every person will translate this a little bit different, and you will see exactly the document where it switches. By providing the translators with the same pre translations, all of them, I can guide them towards the directions how a company would like to express itself in these certain use cases and hence increase the consistency tremendously across all the translators working for one um, customer. Now, the question you should ask how can um, such a small company like ours? Um, achieve these 50% or more improvements in cost and time saving. And in order to um, answer that, um, I picked out very uh, simply easily depicted what you need for machine translation as ingredients. You, and I guess this applies in general for any machine learning um, application. You need a technology, you need the computing power to train the machines, you need data to train it with, and something that people very often unfortunately forget about, you need a human in the loop to ensure the quality either of your training data set or as in our case of the output that the machines give. So the technology today is not so is not the edge anymore these days. Everyone publishes his machine translation engine work on GitHub, you can all use it open sourcely, Facebook, Google, everyone has it. And the computing part we talked about is not a problem anymore. But what is the real key here and what gives the real edge is the data. So the customer specific translation data. So that's why we focus from the very beginning on that our customers have to centralize all their translation demand on our platform so that we can, based on this data, train the engines. And the more they can give us from previous translation agencies or providers, the cheaper prices um, we can offer them. And lastly, the, uh, the key to unlock the power of machine translation in a professional setting is um, to really nail this human-machine interaction. And that's what a huge portion of our research in our company is focusing on. And we have by now a team of 2,000 expert linguists who are trained to post-edit machine translations and who are continuously ensuring the highest, out the highest quality output, not only that our customers are happy, but that our training data sets are clean and we can reuse them for uh, re-adapting the engines after an order has been placed. With that being said, um, thank you very much for having me. If you would like to learn a little bit more about machine translation or what we're actually offering to our customers, please ask me any questions or I'll also be around afterwards and mm -hmm. you can answer any questions then. Thank you. So I'm directly asking the question, so how, how does this relate to 
to the fees that you're actually paying out to the translators, or is just this is this just a, um, a vehicle to to uh, globalize uh, service that could this could be um, served equally in an equally high quality if you would have done it in in Germany with a, um, a proper team of skilled translators at hand. Mm -hmm. So these are two questions, right? Like, what you're saying is right, but I guess that's, as you say, 20, 10 years ago when people realized in-house translation resources don't make sense because you cannot have for every domain and every expertise of person sitting there, you will be not, not have to work all the time. So it makes sense to outsource it and pull the demand to give it to people. That's sort of fact what we focused on in the beginning, the process automation. But then you exactly have the problem when you do this as a company and you work with a lot of freelancers and you have to do all this work. That's what the platform automates for you to find for no matter what you translate, give it to the right person to do it. And so this is a little bit independent of the, um, because that's just how much you as a company decide you want to pay or, I mean, usually pay always relates to the proceeds or the quality you're getting back. So of course you can have outsource it and very far to, I don't want to name many countries, but the quality you get back will also be accordingly uh, from our experience. So um, what we're saying is that by automating the processes, which are project managers are currently doing, by taking this component out, writing back emails all the time, finding the right translators, coordinating them, you can save 30%. And then by the machine translation, you can take out the first initial human translation, because the machine translation is already so good that it doesn't take translators so much to prove it. And that, of course, you can also do with uh, Google and Deepel, etc. But by training a model to, on customer-specific data, you get to a quality level two to three times higher. And by two to three times higher, we measure that as the post-editing time. So how long does it take a human to proofread a few machine translated text until it's at the same level that a human would have done? And there, when you compare the metrics, it's three times faster. That's how we can save time. So now coming back to your question, how we how we pay the translators, we currently still pay them per word, so they're actually making more money currently than they did before, because they need less time. However, we're switching probably soon our price instruction the translator side to hourly pay. Because some of these engines get so good that you really don't have to do much anymore. And um, then it's like you can, of course, increase the hour profit margin, or on the other hand, go much deeper into the market to offer much more competitive prices than we already do. That answer your <laughs> yes. questions. And uh, perhaps just to add, uh, sorry, I, because I also work at the field, just to add to that, there's a big discussion amongst translators about that. A lot of translators are actually concerned that this kind of makes their work like less well paid and so on. Yes. But actually, if you have a really good post editor translator who also can do post editing, those people often need to be much more qualified. They need to be really good to spot the stuff and to then do it well. So actually, that for them, could be in the future actually mean that the good ones yeah. actually have a much better standing and are not so much pressured by the yeah. word counts and so on. It's, it's actually like that's why I mentioned if you spend a fair amount of research, money, and time on this part, how you can make the work between machines and humans as efficient as possible. Because I we learn already that as you mentioned it, you need much higher qualified staff to actually post edit these things because you have all noticed that like how good DL is actually the problem with these neural networks and machine translation also in general is is that they become fuzzy, meaning it's a very nice readable text, but the content is not 100% accurate anymore. So then you need a real expert who can find these mistakes that in this context you cannot use this kind of word because it changes the meaning completely. And that's why you need someone who's much more qualified. So it's, but the really important thing to, to understand is that this is targeted all towards professional, high quality translations, targeted towards publication, how you can make use of technologies um, that are already out there in machine translation to increase the efficiency. Yes? You mentioned that you, want to, that you store the data from the customers. And you experience a lot of pressure or fear that they don't want to share and share the data with you after you do the translation. Mm -hmm. So actually, they don't, the minute we um, explain to them that we use it to improve their model, and that means over time that they also get cheaper translations, but most importantly better translations, 
because money, money is not so interesting actually to many people. To the people who are in the localization space, large corporates, they need quality, they need reliable quality, so they understand that you can increase the consistency with trading that. Then your question becomes interesting because our business model becomes really powerful once we could throw all the translation data into one pool to train a big vertical good machine translation engine. And that we currently don't do it because exactly that purpose, because we don't want to scare off people, but we just have to use that again the technology, either through encryption mechanisms or to removing um, company um, specific data points such as num uh, company names or product names so that you can use it for training without being able that you can infer back from which customer training data came. So, but that's a really good point, and that's something we're working on very heavily, that we can achieve this data network effect, of course, in the future. So maybe quickly follow up question. So are you, did I understand correctly, that you say you train the specific data of one customer for this customer, mm -hmm. but in parallel you say to them, okay, I'm going to anonymize in a way your data, I'm going to get to you, use it only anonymized for other purposes. Or are you using only the anonymized for all the purposes? Then okay, it gets very technical now, but I'll try to do it very short. So what we're really focusing on is not so much on the um, network architecture. As I said, this is out there, and there are a lot of people who have spent a lot of time optimizing that. What we focus on is training data selection and engine selection. So when it comes to training data selection, the ideal thing would be you get a document, you look at all similar translation data you have, and you spin up an engine training with just with that data so that you can get a model that is very well fit only for this specific purpose and can do really good translations, whereas for something else it will be horrible. That will be for us in optimizing the magic of post editing. Which is interesting. Now, um, of course, the bigger your pool of training data will be where you can pull from, the better you could do this. That's the entire thing. Right. Looking at the clock a little bit, catch Crystal very at the end, right? Um, and get your questions. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you.